Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around I've got a couple of science fiction films for you. One from 1992 and another one from 2006. The first one is a time travel story which is really grounded in the personality of the characters and the other one is about the dangers of genetic engineering. So let's start with genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is not as bad as people make it out to be. We all have eaten genetically modified foods whether we're against them or not. And I don't think it's doing us any harm. There are types of genetic engineering which are maybe not as well considered as making your baguette tastier. In 2009, a really interesting American-Canadian director called Vincenzo Natale made a movie called Splice. And Splice is the real deal when it comes to science fiction. It stars Adrian Brody and Sarah Polly as a couple of genetic researchers called Elsa and Clive who are messing around with recombinant DNA to create living creatures whose body chemistry may be useful in creating certain pharmaceuticals. They create a couple of blobby looking creatures called Fred and Ginger for fairly obvious reasons. They work for a company called NERD, which is Nucleic Exchange Research and Development, which is probably one of the worst thought out names for a company in movie history. Bob will allow that one. But Clive and Elsa, who are a couple, decide to go a little bit further and they create a creature which has human and animal DNA that that's going to then allow them to find more proteins which may be useful in pharmaceutical production but it's ethically against the rules and so they do it in secret. They develop a viable female hybrid creature and they decide that they're going to destroy it before it comes to term and is born but they don't do that. It also convinces Clive to let it live, and it becomes a creature known as Dren, played by a French actress and model called Delphine Chaniac. And Dren is creepy. In her physical form, she looks a little bit uncanny valley. Even though she is played by an actress, there's subtle ways that they make her look more alien. She doesn't have any body hair. She's got a long tail with a scorpion-like sting on the end of it. She's amphibious. They find out she's got wings. And she's also got legs that don't bend the same way humans do. They're more like animal legs. When they do a presentation with Fred and Ginger for the people who run the company, things go wrong because they haven't noticed that Ginger has spontaneously changed to male. And the two blobby creatures they've got kill each other in a frenzy. They move Dren and their experiments to a farm where else grew up. And Dren starts developing at a higher rate and becomes an adult very quickly and becomes an adult that doesn't have the same emotions and motivations that a human being does. Clive then finds out that the human DNA used to create Dren is not from a random donor but from Elsa herself and so in a very real sense Elsa is Dren's mother. Things start getting out of hand from there. I'm not going to do spoilers on this one past that point. Adrian Brody who's a bit sus at times is good as Clive. Sarah Polly playing Elsa is fantastic. Really fine filmmaker now she's given up acting but is making films as a director and doing very very well with it but her Elsa is an interesting character and has an interesting arc particularly towards the end of the film Delphine Shaniak playing Dren is is really really creepy with her eyes space wide apart and big eyes as well she's a combination of another but of different traits which was a deliberate choice by Vincenzo Natale she's creepy she's dangerous feeling and in a very odd way, she's sexy. Now, this, of course, leads into that trope of born sexy yesterday, which is also a trope in The Fifth Element, where Lilu is born and then suddenly becomes a sex partner to Bruce Willis's Corbin Dallas, while she's still, in any meaningful term, a child. And Dren has this as well, though. She's not human, and her mind and her body are changing at an accelerated rate but in spite of that that sexiness has an uncomfortable edge to it because of the fact that she's less than a year old and Vincenzo Natale unlike Luc Besson with the fifth element is very aware of that and there are transgressive things that occur which are deliberate choices 
to make the audience feel uncomfortable. This is, in some ways, a little bit like a Cronenberg movie. There's a lot of body horror and a lot of mutated physicality to this film. Which, again, is a deliberate choice. What is it with Canadians and body horror? They're very good at it. Even though Vincenzo Natale was born in America, he's a Canadian now. I found the ending of the film shocking, to be honest with you. And shocking in a good way. It's not like the kind of shocking that makes you walk out and dislike the film. It's the kind of shocking that makes you like the film even more. Now, I've got a Blu-ray of this one, which I picked up at one of the last blockbusters left in Melbourne. They were selling off all of their stuff and I picked this one up second hand. And the reason I remember that is the disc itself has a blockbuster video sticker on it. So it's kind of nostalgic to have this one. Spice is a movie you should see. And it's one of those things that I really like because it's not science fiction in name only. At its heart, it's deeply science fiction. It's a Frankenstein story. Unashamedly so. And it's also in a little bit of that old, old, old science fiction movie trope where there are things mankind is not meant to know. I've never had the time in my life where having more information led to worse decisions. And I think that we should know things and we should know the perils and the advantages of the things. So that thing about there are things mankind is not meant to know is not applicable to real life. In this one, it's a cautionary tale. It's saying if we choose to create living things, recombining the genetic traits of other things, particularly if we use the DNA of human beings who are very smart for apes, then there is a potential for unforeseen circumstances, some of which are going to be within our control, some of which are definitely not. I mean, I think demonstrating that in a fictional form with a movie like this is a good thing. This movie is about technology and the impact of technology on how we see the human race and how we define the human race. Of course, all this becomes very moot if we're living in a simulation, which is another possibility. And there are scientists seriously trying to figure out whether we are or not. And if we are living in a simulation, hi to the people running the simulation. Can you tweak my part of the simulation to make me a bit richer? But having said that, I really like Benjamin's and Natali's work. I like Cube. I like Cypher. I really liked the stuff he did on the peripheral. The brief TV series based on the novel by William Gibson. He was the executive producer on that and directed the pilot episode. He also directed an episode of Luke Cage. He's done a lot of television and stuff. Because his kind of genre movie and, and TV series as well is not necessarily the kind that gets a lot of money. It's interesting, and it's important to the history of science fiction. Movies like Cube and Cypher really punch well above their weight in the fact that they've got bold concepts. They are really ambitious for their budgets, and they're trying to say something. And I think we should definitely and always encourage that in any creative person working in the science fiction genre or any other genre for that matter. But just to finalise on Splice, I like it. I think it's probably one of the best science fiction movies from the first decade of the 21st century. It has something to say. It says it well. It punches you in the guts on the way out. And I could re-watch it every year and enjoy it in new ways. And the ensemble works, the writing works, the direction works, and the monster at the heart of the film is as creepy as it gets. That's the first of the films. The second one is a much, much gentler science fiction movie, which varies from the original work upon which it's based a lot, but I don't think it does it in a negative way. I like a good time travel story, and there are so many bad time travel stories. When you look around science fiction movies, there are so many really bad science fiction time travel movies. I was looking through Tubi and I found like 50 of them. But in 1992, there was a very interesting one, scripted and directed by David Toohey, who went on to do the Riddick films with Vin Diesel, including the first one, Pitch Black and, and the others. And it's a movie called Timescape, which was released on video as Grand Tour 
Disaster in Time, which is a stupid name for it. But Timescape was based on a 1946 novella, Vintage Season, written by Henry Cutner and C.L. Moore. They were writing under the name Lawrence O'Donnell. And it's a time travel story set in a small town with some interesting things to say about some phenomena which are occurring in our modern world. It stars Jeff Daniels as a guy called Ben, who is running a small country inn. He's renovating it with his young daughter, Hilary, played by Ariana Richardson, who was the little girl who was chased by velociraptors in Jurassic Park. His wife has died in a tragic accident that he blames himself for, and his father-in-law, played by an interesting character actor called George Murdoch, is the local town judge and is fighting to get custody of Hillary because he believes that Ben's not a good father. Ben is self-medicating with alcohol a bit, but he's functional, he's renovating the inn, and he is a good father to Hillary. We see that demonstrated in the early parts of the movie. Now, the guest house isn't completely renovated when the local bus driver, Oscar, pulls up with a bunch of people to stay at the inn. And they're strange. And they're strange. They, they dress very well. They're looking around at everything. They don't quite know how things work. One of them doesn't know how to tie his own shoelaces. And they've decided to stay at Ben's Inn on the edge of this town in Ohio, rather than the big hotel in town. And Ben can't figure this out. There's a very beautiful woman called Reeve amongst the tourists. And Ben is kind of attracted to her. And the tour guide, Madam Ivan, played by Marilyn Lightstone, is kind of creepy, but is paying very well for the privilege of them staying at Ben's Inn. What Ben finds out through various means is that they're actually time travellers who have come to that time and place for a specific reason, but he doesn't at first know what it is. It soon becomes obvious when part of the town is blasted by a meteorite and totally destroyed in a major disaster. But the tourists don't go away. They're waiting for something else to happen. And the thing does happen. And Ben finds himself in a struggle against people from an utopian future who are so bored with their life, their perfect lives in the future, where all the ducks are lined up. Everybody lives a long time. Everybody lives a happy life. Everybody's got enough to eat, drink, shelter, everything you need. But there's no tragedy in their lives. There's no edge to their lives. And so the time travellers have become disaster tourists in the same way we have disaster tourists at various times. Every time there's a major disaster in Australia, there'll be cars full of people heading towards it so they can vlog it or put it on the YouTube channel or something like that. So this movie and its original source material from 1946 anticipates disaster tourism in a time travel context. So Ben has to find a way to help his town, rescue his daughter, and he is incredibly outraged that these time travelling disaster tourists are like vultures sitting around waiting for the corpses to mount up. Jeff Daniels is really good in this. He is giving his A game. His Ben is a very troubled man, but he's a good father. He's trying to do things. He's a contractor, so he's helping to rebuild the bell tower in the local church. He's part of his community. He's liked by most people in town, apart from the judge who blames him for the death of the judge's daughter, his wife. And so you've got this dynamic set up where the characters are really grounded in their time and place. And we like Ben. We like him. We like Hillary. We like the town priest. He's not very priesty, but he's kind of nice. We like Oscar, the very eccentric bus driver. We don't like the time travellers because there's something missing from them, from our viewpoint as 21st century humans, or in the case of this movie, 20th century humans. It's a fine hidden gem of a science fiction film. It's hard to find out what did get a DVD release, which I've priced on eBay as a little too expensive. It was filmed in the 3 to 2 aspect ratio for television in the day, which is a bit of a shame because I wouldn't mind it being widescreen. And even though it wasn't made with a large budget, the special effects are used sparingly, but to very fine effect. And the time travel is moving in and out of 1992 it is done with a flickering of lights and a fade out as they walk out of the 
current time. There's no fancy pants special effects for the time travel thing. It's done very subtly. And there are also a couple of interesting things like when the time travelers are about to leave 1992 to go somewhere else. They're all wearing really weird clothes and really weird makeup. And you think that must be what they wear in the future. But no, they're heading for a disaster in a future New Orleans Mardi Gras where there's a big fire. And so they're dressed for a Mardi Gras parade. And I kind of like that. It adds to the weirdness of it all. Now, there is a kind of soft ending to this where Ben gets his reward for being brave and for being somebody who stands up to these people who are incredibly powerful from his point of view. And so he gets a grace note at the end of it. But sometimes deus ex machina endings or company endings are earned by the characters. And I think in this case they are. In a lesser movie, I think Ben's arc at the end of the film, which is done very subtly, will be unforgivable and will be something that lets the audience down. But because we're so invested in the character, his dilemma, his life, his family, and what he does to try to rescue his community, the movie allows us to accept the ending, which is very, very different from the ending that we have in the original story, which is kind of hardcore and is something that probably wouldn't have filmed well in the 1992 context. I really like this one. It's one of those kind of small movies from the 90s that stays with you and that, that you can like, kind of like cast a deadly spell. It's in that bracket of well-made genre films that know what kind of movie they are. In Christ the Daily Spell, the people who made that knew about Lovecraftian horror and Private Eye movies and things like that, so they made a very fine film. And in this one, they know time travel, they know science fiction. And David too has gone on to make other science fiction works that show he is well-grounded in the genre, as in the, in the same way that Vincenzo Natale is, the guy who made Splice. Timescape which people got confused because there was a Gregory Benford novel called Timescape, which came out roughly the same time. And so there was people going, oh, people are making Gregory Benford's novel as a movie. But no, it was a different movie, but just with the same name. And I like it. I think that it could do with a re-release, even though it is in that um, old school aspect ratio. I think a decent Blu-ray release of it wouldn't be a bad thing to have. And we've got to preserve and appreciate these lesser science fiction movies from 30 years ago which really have something about them that is just a little bit different from the usual big blockbuster zoom zoom bang bang pew pew science fiction movies that we were inflicted with in the last half of the 20th century timescape definitely worth tracking down there's probably a copy of it somewhere on youtube you can probably find it there but if you're looking for a physical copy of it you're going to be forking out a few bucks for that. So then are the two films. Very different. What about genetic engineering and the perils of it, which is very much for grown-ups. And then you've got Timescape, which you can watch with a kid. I don't think it's too far out there for, to be bad to watch with a child. But again, they're grounded in genre. They're made by people who know what they're doing. And they entertain and they deliver on the promises they make in this setup. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. I'm much on the mend. Thank you to everybody who has sent wonderful messages about my brief stay in hospital. I'm doing all the right things. I'm going to see the doctors I need to see. I'm taking all the medications they're giving me. I'm almost like a maraca these days with all of the pills I've got in me. But the prognosis is good. So thank you for caring and thank you for supporting. And on that note, if you want to support the channel, like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. You can also become a channel member and donate there, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. Next up, I've got something interesting for Monday, and I've kind of almost worked that one out. That's the Sunday video for those of you who are on the slow part of the planet. And then Wednesday is the random one. I think I've got a couple of things on the way that'll be interesting. And then we get back to science fiction Saturday again on Saturday, which is Friday for the people who are on the slow part of the planet. So until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, and watch some lesser science fiction films from people who know science fiction. And I'll catch you next time.